Hello, everyone, and welcome to uh, the Aspen Institute Germany's uh, virtual conversation series on COVID-19 and tech uh, that we are doing in partnership with uh, Google. I am Tyson Barker, and I'm the Deputy Director and Fellow here at Aspen Germany, and we are delighted to have everybody with us today for the fifth in our series, which is going to be talking about digital sovereignty crisis, uh, we're really looking forward to this conversation. Um, I, I think we all are uh, uh, very interested to hear what is happening in the world, sometimes outside of the COVID-19 crisis. And this is an opportunity to see how Germany and Europe are preparing to be fit for purpose in a post-COVID world, particularly in cloud computing. Um, I'm going to give a couple of um, uh, housekeeping points, which I always do at the outset, and then introduce our speakers. Um, first of all, this is on the record. Um, it will be posted to YouTube later. Um, and feel free to tweet about it under the hashtag AspenTech20. Um, we'd love to have your participation and, and to get the word out on this great conversation. Um, second, we're going to do a conversation uh, between the four of us that is going to be about the first 30 minutes. And then we want to open it up to Q&A from the audience. There are three ways that you can ask a question. One, you can write a question in the uh, Q&A box at the bottom, which is a possibility, but our preferred method is actually for you to ask your question yourself. And the way that you can do that is by raising your hand, do use the hand raise icon, and I will call on you, identify yourself, name and affiliation, and who you would like to address your question to. And then if you're calling in, um, you can hit star nine and we'll get to a question from you as well. So uh, those are the housekeeping points and now on to the topic. Um, I think everybody is really interested in this, this idea. It's a big idea um, from the uh, German Ministry of Economics that they've been doing in consortium with uh, many uh, private companies across Europe and the world um, to create a a, a cloud um, ecosystem that really reflects European values. And it's a, it's a really interesting topic. The work on this has continued even during the crisis, and I believe that they're trying to keep pace with some, some internal deadlines that they've set. Um, so we really want to hear about this update and also what's happening in the context of Europe's big plans on tech. So I think many of you are aware uh, in February, uh, the European Commission had a kind of big bang digital package that came out dealing with a new data strategy, a white paper on AI, and a broad digital strategy. And it'd be interesting to hear where uh, Gaia X fits into that. So to talk th th through these points, we have three excellent speakers, and I'm going to go ahead and introduce them right now. Uh, the first is Marco Alexander Bright. Marco Alexander is the head of the AI unit at the Federal Ministry of Economics. And prior to that, he was the head of digital policy principles and coordination uh, at, the, at the economic ministry here in Germany. Uh, he has also served as personal advisor to Peter Altmaier and while he was in the chancellery. And prior to that was uh, Annegret Kramp-Karrenbauer's chief of staff. And as I like to say, he is a Saarlander uh, for at the deep state of Germany, if you're looking for some uh, political movement, political dynamism, you tend to find a Saarlander there many times. So uh, thanks for being with us, Marco. Uh, our second speaker is Ursula Morgenstern. She is the CEO and Managing Director at Atos, Germany, um, and has been with Atos since 2002. So she's, she's, she's a company woman. She knows the company inside and out. Uh, and has also served as CEO of Atos in uh, the UK and Ireland. And our final speaker today is uh, Daniel Baez, who is a member of the Bundestag for the Greens, um, and is the, he's been in the Bundestag since 2017, and is also the Greens representative for startups, and is really kind of a uh, a key connective tissue on tech issues for the Green Party, particularly when it comes to innovation. Um, prior to that, he worked at Boston Consulting Group. Um, so we are delighted to have you as well, Danny, for this conversation. So let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to ask a big question to you first, uh, Marco. Uh, you know, we've heard a lot about Gaia-X Big Bang last year uh, in, in fall uh, 2019. What has happened since? What are the parameters? What are the characters? What are we talking about when we're talking about Gaia-X? 
Yeah, thank you, Tyson, for the invitation and uh, for the opportunity to uh, talk about Gaia X. I am I gladly take the opportunity to overcome three prejudices that I have uh, read in the newspapers and um, probably a lot of participants of the call too. Um, the first prejudice is going to work because it's going to be a European hyperscaler. And I can reassure you that it's not going to be a European hyperscaler. What we are going to do is we will form a federated virtual hyperscaler which links existing European and non-European um, um, cloud and edge services. And on, based on that linkage, we want to establish, as you mentioned, um, um, a vital and hyper and digital ecosystem. This is why it's called Gaia X, because the mother nature, the titan of the Greek mythology, Gaia, who is um, mother nature, so this is our ultimate goal. The second prejudice I want to overcome is that it's a German project. Um, it has started as an idea that has been that has formed itself in the heads of many people and found its first um, narrative and a document that has been born in Germany. But nevertheless, since October of 2019, we established a huge European um, and even worldwide uh, network of companies especially with our friends from France. Um, and now it's, I can call it a Franco-German project indeed. And it's a Franco-German project that is um, in closely linked to other member states, closely linked to Japan, closely linked to South Korean, and closely linked to American companies too. And they all have been part of a very constructive process. So as you can see, it's no longer a German project. It's a European project in its heart, but it's closely linked to um, non-European initiatives Two, the third thing or prejudice that I want to overcome is that's a government cloud. Obviously, there is a huge demand for government clouds all over the world, and everybody's talking about government clouds. But this project, Gaia X, is first and foremost a cloud project that's from business for business. Um, we have more than, or at least um, about 300 companies working on Gaia X right now. As I said, from many member states of the European Union, from Germany, from France, from Italy, for example, from the Netherlands, from the United States. But it's companies that work on Gaia X, and it's companies um, that have the, the best and the needs of companies um, in their mind. Um, I maybe I switch tracks now and talk about what is at the heart of GaiaX. Um, it's two things that we, that we think that we should address with our cloud project. The first thing is we need obviously, and this is something you have heard, a digital sovereignty and data sovereignty. Everybody needs that because sovereignty is um, something that is crucial for, e for each being, for a, member state, for a member state, for a nation state, for um, people um, themselves. And the second is we need data availability. Why do we need data availability? Because obviously in the data economy that's to come, um, the availability of data is what you need if you want to be creative and innovative. And if you have um, a good idea, but you don't, you're lacking the data, then you're obviously not going to make, it, I mean, to make it into a business model. But if you have a good idea and you know the right people and you have an infrastructure that you can that you share, and that you can share data in legal boundaries and uh, within a common framework, obviously we think that this gives a vital uh, innovative potential to all the participants of Gaia X. And again, this is why we called it so. Um, I want to mention two other things that guide us in our um, efforts. The first thing is we try to think cloud and edge from the user's perspective. And this is something obviously in, um, especially in the minds of the businesses and the companies that are involved in the process. And the second thing is we want to be transparent, we want to be open, and we want to extend our hands to everybody that shares our goals and wants to adhere to our rules. So where are we at right now? Um, we have been working pretty silently for the last seven months. That has been purposefully so, because um, we think that working is better than talking. And um, nevertheless, we are uh, in the midst of um, planning um, uh, a very big Gaia X event where you want to share our uh, efforts and our progress to a larger public. And this will be done with political support. It will be done with high level CEO company uh, support. And it will be done in, uh, it will be done very soon. 
you will probably see the invitation as soon as we are ready to submit it. So this is what I can say for the near future, from the far future, as you can see in the document summit in 2019, we want Gaia X up and running, at least in its basic functions, until the end of 2020. And um, this has been a goal that we set ourselves when we have been 20 companies. Now we are almost 300, so I'm very um, enthusiastic about our, um, our efforts and that we're going to reach that target. Thank you. All right, thank, thank you so much, Marco. I was writing while you were, you were speaking and they, a lot of, lot of questions answered and a lot of questions raised and I, I can't wait to get into the conversation with you. Uh, Ursula, uh, you know, when you talk about cloud computing, you talk about network effects, you talk about creating relationships, data relationships with users. How, when you're in these conversations with uh, the Gaia-X folks, how much is this upending those types of business models? And from the first thing, which I think will happen in Germany, and I speak now from, from a German CEO perspective, is it will accelerate dramatically. Uh, COVID-19 has, I think, forced everybody to work from home and has shown companies that it's actually possible to work from home and that digitization is, is actually can be beneficial for companies. They will also have seen the gaps they have in their systems of what they can't take to the cloud, what they can't take to home. So I think there will be a huge, huge push in, into moving to the cloud. And we are seeing that as um, one of the largest IT services companies in the world already happening, and not only in Germany, but everywhere in Europe and everywhere in the world. And um, so I think there is a push which will happen. And in how will Gaia X help? Gaia X will help simply because it will make it easier for European companies who want to, who need to, you know, uh, fulfill the legislation around GDPR, data protection, data privacy, um, to make it actually easy um, to do that in the cloud, which I think has been one of the main barriers. Um, for companies uh, to move to the cloud. Secondly, I think it is helping the Mittelstand, so the, the, the small, medium-sized businesses, which is a really important part of the Germany and to, to make that move to the cloud because they, they are the ones which really, I think we want to see in Germany moving in. It will also allow companies who are thinking, I don't want to be locked into a single provider. I want to be able to move around um, to deal with that question in, in I think, in a, in a more elegant way. Uh, but it also will allow European or you know, wrong European players, but smaller tech players who want to be able to scale up, uh, be part of the Gaia X environment, collaborate and to scale up and also become an active part of the cloud, you know, a global cloud uh, community. So in that sense, uh, I can see that as a, as a second benefit. If I then think about the free flow of data, because that's again, Gaia X is a bit like um, allowing free flow of data across companies, across company borders, that of course will drive innovation. If I look at it from a company perspective, I, I will be able to create ecosystems where I can put in my data, but I can control my data. I Use. So I can commercialize my data, I can optimize, you know, I can think about ecosystem solution where we really look at a whole supply chain and, uh, and say, okay, how do I, how do I um, come up with creative new business models? And that, again, I think will be a very, very interesting, um, so, you know, interesting next steps for Gaia X or how companies can work. And we all know, again, in Germany, platform solutions, those new business models have been very, very slow in being adopted, often around because of boundary issues, country boundary issues, and um, legal concerns about data protection. Again, Gaia X can help. Again, I think COVID 19 um, will help to drive that and has shown some of the problems we have in Europe by not having such an infrastructure. If I just think about the hospital beds, we had, you know, free hospital beds in some regions of Europe and uh, overloading in other regions. And really to coordinate 
how do I move uh, patients from one hospital or from one region to the other? Uh, a Gaia X solution um, uh, or uh, an, uh, a data space or a data uh, economy could have really helped because we could have said all hospitals uh, across Europe, close to boundaries, bringing their data together and we're starting to optimize hospital beds um, occupancy. The other um, development we are expecting is a change in supply chain. One of the big post-COVID conversations which we think will start to happen is about uh, that companies will want to broaden their supply chain, to lessen their dependency on individual suppliers, to be able to react in crisis more flexibly than they could in the current crisis. And again, that's where creating uh, these, um, you know, economy, econo ecosystems will, will really help. So I think that's why I really believe Gaia-X can help to drive cloud adapt adoption. But Gaia-X is of course not only about cloud, it's also taking into account uh, edge computing and will have one uh, policy, one architecture, which is covering both the cloud and, and edge computing. And again, uh, edge computing will really drive uh, the volume of data. We believe that 80% of the data will be processed uh, in, in the, at the edge. And, and again, having a technology which is taking into account of edge and cloud computing is, in our opinion, really important. It's interesting, you know, you talked about the, the Germany status as a, 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 honestly a laggard in cloud adoption. And I've done some work on this and you look at the DESI index that the commission brings out. And I think Germany is 25, 20, in 25th 24. place. 24th place. Okay, so it's it's quite behind, but you know sometimes necessity is the mother of invention, and so we yeah. do have the situation where we're all being pushed into using cloud solutions. I'm going to get back to that with Marco in a bit, uh, asking what the reason behind the low cloud adoption is. But first, I want to go uh, to Danny and ask kind of a a big question, a kind of political question, which is, you know, you've written about and you've spoken about Europe's uh, geopolitical future when it comes to tech. Um, and you're being competitive with big players like uh, the United States and big tech companies coming out of the US, China and big tech companies coming out of China. Uh, where do you see Gaia-X, cloud computing, and generally industrial policy fitting into that? Well, first of all, it's uh, quite interesting that we have a discussion about uh, innovation, about economics, and about geopolitics, uh, basically, all all bridging this together, which is a new sort of of, of, of discussion. I mean, um, getting back actually to the last uh, panel discussion I was having at the Aspen Institute, I think it was last year in the Landesvertretung Baden-Württemberg, I talked about the European way between uh, US and China and then John Kornblum approached me and said, ah, that was a very U European answer uh, that you gave and that's not a compliment. And um, so uh, I don't want to... The, First of all, I want to start with Axie Tyson. You should know best because the, both, uh, the two of us have written an article about it. And there is a lot of common ground when we talk about innovation and the United States. First of all, that's because we share uh, a certain set of values. And as we understand, also due to the uh, current administration in the US, these values come under pressure. This is uh, one side um, um, of, of the battle. And uh, so, on the other side, uh, I've been to China last year, actually for the first time in my life, and I was astonished, yeah, fascinated and, and shocked at the same time when we visited Alibaba, yeah, one of the most prominent tech companies in, in, in China, and they introduced their model of digital payment, a topic where, where Germany and where Europe is very uh, way behind, and um, what, what, what is their strategy and what is their use of data. And, so there are some, uh, some, some common, common grounds for uh, the US and for Europe. But when we, for example, talk about uh, the, the topic of digital payment and the, uh, um, yeah, the um, motivation of Libra yeah, made by Facebook uh, entering the market for new digital private currencies, this uh, um, yeah, uh, gets a lot of contradiction uh, in Germany, but also uh, in, in, in Europe. And this gives us the motivation in order to find our own um, uh, approach of digitizing our society, our economy, and also dealing 
with data. Sometimes you hear the story that Germans especially are obsessed with data protection. Maybe there's some sort of truth in it. But on the other hand, I mean, when we talk about data protection, when we talk about individual freedom of rights, when we talk about digital sovereignty, um, this, is, this, is, this is important for us. This is important for Europe. And as you see, there was a, some regulation passed uh, last year, the GDPR, very, very uh, highly uh, discussed in Germany and actually all over the world, the da data, uh, general data protection uh, uh, regulation, um, Datenschutzgrundverordnung, as we say in Germany. And actually what we showed is that we can set a certain standards for the world because companies like Google's and other ones didn't, uh, uh, didn't, find loop uh, didn't uh, look for loopholes or didn't look for several strategies for different uh, continents uh, where they make business, but they said, okay, we want, to, um, um, we want to be compliant with the GDPR, so let's just roll out our technology all over. So this is actually the leverage that, uh, that Europe has. But when we talk about innovation and values, it's not only about, uh, of course, and this is something where, where, where we are way behind the, um, uh, the curve. Uh, that's something that we also face in this current corona crisis, which is an accelerator of disruption, which is an accelerator of digitalization, and which also points out the white spots and the missed opportunities that we have when, we, when, when it comes to, uh, to, um, to innovation. And uh, we had most prominently just a few weeks ago uh, the, this conversation about um, the vaccine, vaccine against uh, a, a corona. And there were some um, um, rumors that the Trump and his administration are uh, negotiating with a German startup from Tübingen, who actually just today came up with some very positive results on testing the vaccine. And, and everyone was more or less shocked. Yeah? What, what's, what's the, what is about the story? And the investor and the CEO said, no, there's nothing uh, on the story. We want to deliver the vaccine for the world. But it showed to us very closely when it comes to innovation, it's not uh, a good thing to be dependent on other uh, uh, regions. That's uh, another motivation why Europe has to go uh, its own way. And uh, we want to be successful in innovations. And this also needs a more courageous a role of the government. Um, just to give another example, so currently we are using Zoom, a nice technology. Uh, I looked up the numbers, there were 10 million uh, Zoom users in December 2019. Now it's over 200 million, so it exploded basically. We are using Zoom currently here. Many uh, 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 parliamentarians of my colleagues, they use it as well. It's a nice technology. But if you look at number two, who's number three, who's number four, basically 99% of the market share are U.S. companies. And I mean, since this is a discussion as the Aspen Institute, this is a, a, this is a, a, a success. Yeah. On the same, on the on the other hand, we as Europeans and also we as Germans, we have to ask ourselves why is there, why is there not a German player? Why is there not a European player? What are we missing on this? And basically, what I'm proposing, what we need is three things. One is we are very good in inventing ideas. We have strong universities. We are not so good in commercializing these ideas. This is a sort of a mindset question. The last very big company that was, has been founded and now is global player is SAP in my constituency, but there are not too many other tech companies who have followed in that size. Second, what we still lack, and that's I, I know a topic that also Mark uh, Alexander is, is, is dealing a lot with, uh, how do we attract more venture capital, not only to uh, Germany, but to Europe, all, all, to all over Europe? And third, um, how do we combine this with policy and an industrial policy strategy? And I think Gaia X, and I'm, I'm, I'm from the opposition now, I should ask some serious questions to Marco Alexander. Why are we not faster? Why do we not put more political support on it? But let's, let's keep the party politics away uh, today for today, because we share the same goal that this is an important piece in developing a German, but also a European industrial policy strategy to move forward when it comes to technical technological sovereignty. All right, uh, thank you so much, Denny. I mean, again, many, many, many things uh, put on the table. I'm gonna pick up some of these pieces and, and, and throw some questions at you guys. Then we're gonna do a poll, then we're gonna kick it to the audience. We got 115 people uh, watching us right now. So uh, Marco, let me start with you. You mentioned a couple of, um, uh, you 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 b busted a lot of myths, which was good to start off with, and then you mentioned a couple of principles. Uh, the two that I picked up on, they're really important and they come up a lot, are digital sovereignty and data availability. And both of these are very vague, 
terms. Uh, under digital sovereignty, you could understand it as meaning national sovereignty in kind of a classical geopolitical sense, or you could understand it as personal sovereignty in the sense of I have control over my personal data and I can move it in a kind of informational self-determinational sense. Uh, I guess my first question is, which one are we talking about? You're on mute. Yes, I politely muted myself. So, um, so the first thing is that um, digital sovereignty, the word sovereignty is probably a difficult term for English speakers because obviously sovereignty is something very state-based in the English language. In Germany, um, we have digitale souveränität, but in English, it's probably something in the middle between digital sovereignty and digital autonomy. So this is difficult to translate um, in these terms. Um, what we are talking about when we talk about digital uh, sovereignty and data sovereignty in this case is that you are the one that makes the decisions on whom you give your data, who precedes your data, and whom can see your data, and whom you want to share your data with. So um, as um, um, Ursula Morgenstein and Daniel Ras already um, mentioned, um, the GDPR is a huge cornerstone in digital and data sovereignty. Um, the thing is, it's obviously understood by everybody that um, states and uh, the European Union are in perfect in the position to um, make people follow their rules. So GDPR is something that for us is a huge cornerstone in data sovereignty. The next thing, and this is the question you asked ask too, is, is it a personal thing or is it the thing that, um, that is about state? In the end, Gaia-X addresses the data sovereignty of states and of companies, but the personal data is obviously, um, is obviously not excluded. It's just some derived, you can derive personal data from kind of all machine data if you have enough data sets. So if you know who is working on which um, um, line at 10 o'clock in the morning, and then you know the data about the product that has been produced there, you obviously have some personalized data. So we are focusing on business data and on state's data, but personal data is obviously not out of the question. Okay, um, then I'm gonna get back to you with a question on, on data availability, but first let's, let's uh, kick up our first poll. Uh, Toby, do you wanna put up our poll? All right, this is a poll for everybody to answer and anybody who's calling in, I'll, I'll read it out loud so you can hear it, but you can't vote, but everybody else can. It's uh, Europe's quest for technological sovereignty, digital sovereignty or data sovereignty, uh, and Gaia-X are necessary to establish a European tech alternative to the US and China. So do you strongly disagree, agree, neither agree or disagree, disagree or strongly disagree? So we're gonna give you guys a couple of minutes to, uh, to answer that question. And while you do, I'm gonna ask um, Ursula a little bit about data availability. So there's a big discussion right now, you mentioned it as well, data portability, the ability to change you, um, uh, providers, cloud providers, edge providers, et cetera. How would this change the, uh, the landscape in, in uh, the global cloud landscape or the global uh, data storage landscape, if you can just, move your data from one place to another? Do you think this is empowering or do you think this will be limiting in some ways? I think it's um, giving uh, companies choice, um, just simply choice, um, consumers and companies. And uh, again, Gaia-X is not positioned uh, against the hyperscalers. The hyperscalers, uh, you know, again, as a big IT services company, we're working very closely with hyperscalers as well. And many of our companies are really making clear choices and saying, yeah, we really, you know, see the benefit to work with company A, B or C and, and really committing that. But equally, in other scenarios, uh, a multi-cloud strategy uh, is more helpful because I might deal, you know, if I, I have a complex supply chain, I'm dealing with many players in that uh, supply chain. And, and again, not everybody will have chosen the technology I have chosen. And therefore having that ability um, to uh, work across multi-cloud is, is an additional choice companies have. So I think it's more a choice than an either or debate, which we should have. So do you think we should be having, you know, we, 
We've been having a lot, I, this might be apples and oranges, but I think that they, they rhyme with each other. We've been having a lot of debate around centralized versus decentralized <laughs> um, uh, contact tracing app solutions. Yeah. Uh, should, do you think that this is, has some echo with the, the debate around cloud? It, it's, um, yes, I mean, to a certain extent, <laughs> we all are now experts in centralized and decentralized tracing and uh, the debate. And again, what we, um, but perhaps starting, we all have looked, perhaps start, staying with the tracing debate, we all looked at South Korea and thinking, why is South Korea so fast? Because, of course, they had a ready-made infrastructure on which they could jump. So having something which is ready-made uh, and which allows countries to collaborate over boundary uh, over uh, over borders is 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 probably something good. If I look at now centralized and decentralized cloud, um, coming back to the Internet of Things, which I mentioned before, and com you know edge computing, the cloud is not the only thing in town. It will be cloud and edge computing. Right. So we will need to. Uh, you know, we are decentralized, whatever we wish to do, we will be decentralized. And even if I uh, look at, and we are already decentralized by just that we are trying to use a mobile phone um, for the contract tracing app, and that's exactly the debate we said. So so from my perspective, we are decentralization uh, is, um, is a topic we have to deal with, any architecture has to deal with it, and therefore Gaia, again, is look, Gaia X is looking at making sure that the same architectural standards and policies applying both to cloud and to edge computing. That's, that's helpful. And we are going to definitely get into talking about IoT because uh, let's be honest, that's the, the future of German, the German industrial yes. base in many ways. Um, we, have, we have four questions and we have the results of our poll. So we're going to look at the poll and then get some questions from the group. So here are our answers. The question again, just to read it, was Europe's quest for, or for technological sovereignty and Gaia-X are necessary to establish a European tech alternative to the US and China. 37% uh, strongly disagree, or excuse me, strongly agree. Uh, agree. So in total, we have 79%, correct my math if I'm wrong, 79% either agree or strongly agree. 6% uh, neither agree nor disagree, 6% disagree, and 9% strongly disagree. So from our 112 people on the line right now, there is an overwhelming sense that Europe does need to establish uh, technological sovereignty and GAIA-X is part of that. Um, we have some questions. I'm going to read the first one, and then we have one hand up. I'm going to give priority to people who raise their hands so they can ask their questions themselves, but I'm going to ask the first one that was written in by Patrick. And it is, uh, I'll give it to, to Marco Alexander, uh, but it was a, if you want to answer this as well, you can. Uh, it's, where is Gaia-X physically located and protected? What are potential weaknesses? Well, Gaia X is physically located with, uh, within the, the storage solutions of the companies that are involved. So there will not be uh, like something that's like a governmental-led uh, storage uh, of data that's called Gaia X. Um, whenever a customer of a company that is, uh, that is connected to Gaia X, your data will be stored at their place. Okay. And possible weaknesses. Well, possible weaknesses is obviously. You could mention cybersecurity here, which is a weakness um, that, or better, a challenge that everybody has now. But this is something GAIA-X will address, and it's something the companies involved need to address to have um, to have the opportunity to be part of GAIA-X in the first place. And the second thing is, it's in their it's in their best interest to do so. You know, you are you are a customer of a company because you trust them to uh, succeed in their efforts in cybersecurity. GAIA-X will address it, but not on itself. The companies will do that. Thanks, Marco. Ursula, do you want to uh, address any challenges that you see? Uh, again, and where it's located? It, it's probably located at Atos. No, it's located again. It's it's um, Gaia X is in that sense. It's driven by you know architecture standards, which is uh, helping to link and um, and and the various players together. All the companies we which which want to be part of Gaia X and which are signing up to the standards, signing up to the policies. So it's really, uh, in that sense, um, a decentralized system. And uh, but what it should enable users to say, I really want to have a, 
or you know a database which is PCI DSS compliant in Greece. Uh, please, you know, uh, give me a provider which is fulfilling those requirements. So it's really ensuring that we are linking uh, all of the various um, players who are interested in being part of GaiaX together. So, so it's and it's more than 300 companies now who are really showing interest in that. So it, you need to think about GaiaX as a also architecture standards and policies uh, and which, which are holding the, the company, or, or which are bringing various players together. And clearly cybersecurity is a challenge for everybody. Uh, and, and again, um, part of the uh, work is and will be to develop a concept of continuous monitoring and, and making sure that um, you know, we can fulfill the cybersecurity, high standard of cybersecurity, but cyber, and, and again, there's, we can go back to the debate between decentralized and centralized, what is more secure. From my perspective, we could make the point that um, GAIA-X potentially fulfills the requirement both from best requirements from a decentralized and centralized situation um, because by having common uh, standards, by having a common architecture, by really uh, also ensuring compliance, you have the benefits of a centralized systems, but you're decentralized, so you have no single point of failure. Mm. Uh, thank you so much, Wizla. Um, we have a question from somebody uh, on, on the line. It's from Lukas Ilves, who is possibly in Estonia, I think. Uh, Lukas, you are up. Hi, Tyson. Thank you. I am calling from Estonia. Thank you very much. Um, I'm head of strategy for, for Guard Time, which is uh, a cybersecurity and photography company out of Estonia. Um, and I guess a question a bit, first of all, for everyone, which is, you know, what we found in working on cloud security is that most of our customers are US based, even though we're a European company. And the reason for that fundamentally is because they've got much higher cloud adoption. So what we find is that the need and the interest in using cloud and cloud based solutions really drives the security. And so I'm curious how you look at this kind of chicken and egg problem. Is there a risk that you build this fantastic um, structure with Gaia X, but then, you know, they don't come as customers. Um, my second question, maybe not to, you know, to contradict myself just a little bit, is actually uh, specifically to Marco, which is how do, how do companies that are interested um, in getting involved in this framework approach you guys and, and uh, join the GAIX framework? Thank you. All right. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Lucas. Maybe we can give the first one to Uzla and Danny, and then the second one to Marco. So the question again is the kind of, it's the uh, field of dreams question. If you build it, they will come. You know, what is up with uh, cloud adoption in Europe? Why yeah. is the U.S. taking it so much more than, than Europeans? Uh, Uzla and then maybe Danny, how can, you, how, can you, how can we incentivize Europeans to really start to adopt the yeah. cloud more? Uh, again, it's, a, it's an absolute um, valid point and valid question. It's hotly debated um, throughout the project, but also um, uh, and between the various participants because, and the reason and what has been attempted to do to make sure that the end users, the companies who might be interested uh, in building this ecosystem, these supply chains, this are part of the Gaia X initiative. And um, so far there are already 40 use cases in eight domains which are really uh, have been um, built and uh, are being used. So I think staying close to the end user and really ensuring that um, what is created uh, is, is really fit for purpose or makes any business sense. So, so that is one of the ways of um, attempting to ensure that there is um, the adoption and there's real business value behind uh, what GaiaX is creating. The other big question is of course trust, trust by the um, by the end users, trust by be it, you know middlestand companies, be it corporations, be it end users, and and of course the um, ambition to be transparent, to make it easy to use Gaia X, to make sure that there are clear contra you know the contracts are simple to understand, that you know um, what um, you know what type of protection you have, it would signpost whether. A service you're buying, uh, buying could be open to the Cloud Act or could not be. So again, transparency 
and clear a clear contractual framework is another attempt by building trust and ensuring that therefore uh, cloud adoption is being um, driven forward. That said, I think COVID-19 for the better or the worse has given us this push in digitization, which I think we will see across uh, Europe in any way. All right, uh, thank you, Uzla. Uh, Danny, what about the, how do you incentivize this? How do we get uh, Germans to use the cloud? I mean, that's a hard question. And uh, from, a, from a business perspective, not from a political perspective, I think what we still lack is uh, thinking solutions from the customer perspective. Yeah, this is something I discuss a lot with the startup scene. I also, I'm, I'm a member of the finance committee. That's something I discuss with German banks. Why, why are guys using Apple Pay, but why, why are they not interested in the solution from the Sparkasse or the Volksbank? Yeah. Obviously, because um, uh, especially American tech companies are very eager in building interfaces, customer interfaces, infrastructure from a customer perspective. And they do it very well. Yeah? We have to accept the fact, but that's not, I mean, we can, we can, we can learn that. Yeah? I mean, but now the startup companies, they are not waiting for a politician to tell them, they, they, they know that, they know it better than myself, but that's something maybe also from a political perspective that we can support further by creating the ecosystems um, um, uh, to um, um, yeah, flourish this sort of innovation. And the other point is that Ursula has mentioned it, and I think it's, it's, it's crucial, and it's crucial for, for, for Europe and especially for Germany is trust. Trust as a, as a, as a source uh, for incentivizing. Just to give you an example, I'm from Baden-Württemberg, which is down south. Um, the economic power, one of the economic powerhouses in Germany. But uh, the prototype of a uh, uh, business that we have is the Swabian Mittelständler. Yeah? They are very conservative. They, the holy grail is their business model. They don't want to share with, every, with anybody because they have been successful for, I don't know, 150 years and it's a fifth generation and so on. Yeah? And of course, they, 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 they realize that their industrial business model they will need data as a source for future business models and so on. But we have, to, I mean, we don't have to convince them, but we have to incentivize them to say, okay, using a cloud is, um, is, is, is possible, is making, is making my life easier, maybe also cheaper, cheaper. That's also a very Swabian mindset, saving money. But in the same time, it helps me to keep my business models and my data safe. And where is politics come into play? Just to give you an example, we had a very hard discussion last year uh, when uh, the police in one of the states in Germany uh, made public that they save their data that they take with the body cams. Yeah, when police people go to, the, uh, to, uh, to a soccer game and to watch that there is no violence happening, uh, they save this uh, video material on, on AWS, on, on an Amazon server. And there was a lot of criticism. And currently there was a lot of criticism because the police in Hessia uh, are, uh, was negotiating with Palantir, uh, an American consulting IT company, on um, uh, using some algorithms to improve uh, uh, the capabilities of the police. They now have finished the negotiation because, again, there was a lot of criticism. So if you want to kick off uh, a project like this, I think trust on the, uh, of, of, of the people, of the public, into uh, the government, uh, that you really fulfill standards and requirements um, I think this is one of the most important source and I think, I, I hope at least also looking at Gaia X that we can really point out that um, a, a trust in securing data is an essential uh, currency if we want to have, make this uh, project so successful because once again the mindset is different than in Germany than it is for example in the United States. Yeah. Um... Uh, thanks for that, Denny. Uh, Marco, you had a question about how do you plug and play in this if you are a, 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 a cybersecurity company protecting cloud in Estonia? And I'm going to rack and stack in a couple other questions on that because they're kind of directed at you and they're kind of similar. Uh, Ralph Vesely asks, uh, besides the uh, Federal Ministry of Economic Affairs uh, paper last year, where can somebody get more details about Gaia-X? And also, uh, where can somebody get a list of the 300 companies participating? <laughs> okay, I, maybe if I may, I, um, I completely want to underline what Ursula and Daniel said. Um, um, the, the, utmost, the most important thing that uh, we need um, is the user's perspective and trust. And um, I think um, what Ursula said, the 40 use cases out of eight domains and a huge number of companies that want to work together and share um, ideas and later on data 
um, is kind of um, um, very emphasizing that point that Gaia X has been built with it, with the user's perspective in in mind um, from the very beginning. The second thing is trust, as Daniel mentioned, is very very important, especially for small and medium enterprises, especially if they are family led. And then I think this is what we want to do with Gaia X. We want to establish a trustworthy environment for data proceeding uh, for procession, for, for proceeding data and for sharing data. So I think Processing. Gaia X is uh, is in the end exporting trust. The um, the questions about how many companies are involved and whose names they are, and whose names, um, but I cannot disclose the names, obviously, because um, I'm bound by data protection law too. If they, if they wish to be um, mentioned as participants of GAIA-X, you will hear from them. The next thing is um, you can join the process uh, in the weeks to come. As I said, we are going to the of a larger event where we will disclose more information and your route to join Gaia if you wish to do so. And um, obviously I'm not in um, the position to disclose every, um, every negotiation, every talk I, I do and every phone call. But for example, Estonia, I, in this week, I talked to your governmental CIO about collaborating within the boundaries of Gaia X and the data sharing initiatives that Estonia has. Thank you. All right, we've got a, a question from Ned. Uh, Wiley, then we have a question from uh, Jens Wittig and then from Tim Stutka. So two of them I'm going to read and then one he's going to ask himself. So this is from Ned. It's for any of the panelists. What will Gaia-X do that Microsoft existing cloud service pr providers don't already do? So maybe Marco, you can take that first and then maybe Ursula. So in the end, um, this, is, this is an opportunity to underline that Gaia-X is not an adversary um, of the large cloud service companies. But what do we do? I would say that, um, as Ursula mentioned already, uh, I think she can explain that, uh, uh, she explained that very well, is we are planning for edge. And this is something that's the next, uh, the next big thing to come to IoT, for example, but to all of us in uh, services and applications too. So in the end, with Gaia-X, we strive for the next level architecture of, data, of the data economy and not exactly kind of copycatting uh, or copying copycat of the large cloud service providers. Um, the second thing is what Gaia-X does different is, um, from the user's perspective, it does, it does a lot of things different than um, things that are in the market right now. But from the user's perspective is, if you want to share data with somebody that uses another cloud service provider as you, and you want to do that with a third party or a fourth party, and you want to do that in a trustworthy environment where everybody can where you have interoperable solutions that um, can, can be linked with each other, it's very difficult to do so uh, within the, the, the current environment. And the second thing is migrating data. If you want to change your provider, is a huge, huge hindrance in data sharing and data sharing projects. And this is something Gaia-X addresses uh, from the very beginning too. All right, uh, I'm gonna ask the question from Jens and then Tim, you're up in a second. So uh, Jens Wittig asks, is the government, I guess this is also a question for you, Marco, is the government willing to enter Gaia-X first with all their services in order to set a good example? So maybe just to remind you, you was it, uh, to give, was it? Oh yeah, sorry, was it, please, <laughs> please do. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think for me, Gaia-X, again, the, the the, it is indeed not, um, you know, Gaia X versus the hyperscalers, and therefore the comparison in that sense is um, uh, needs to be adjusted. For me, it's more that it's like, you know, we in in Europe, all the energy companies are collaborating together, and by by linking them together, we can optimize our energy, um, you know, in in line with demand. And for me, Gaia X is a bit the same. It's allowing us to have a free flow of data, uh, not in Europe, but, but everywhere where companies want to uh, and, and countries want to participate. And that free flow of data is different. I think that's one of the key differences which we see. But also, um, in a, it's also saying how do we then use the data and by, uh, for example, I'm also um, part of a group or Atlas is part of the group which is called the International Data Space Association where a data architecture has been developed which can say, I give you my data set, I determine then what with this data set is happening. So one of the examples which was developed was 
um, shipping companies uh, want to forecast when their ships come to port. Uh, and um, it would be really beneficial for all of them to share their data to forecast. Um, you know, how weather and um, is, is uh, influencing how fast the ship travels. Uh, they, they are all competitors, but by putting the data together uh, and for the algorithms to allow them the data to be analyzed, they can improve their forecast, but they are maintaining control of their data. And that is one, again, this is, you know, we, we, you asked the question about is it sovereignty is personal. For me, it is really, I, as the owner of data, should be able to decide, do I give my data away for free? Or do I want to commercialize my data? And then I want to decide, of course, whom and how and, and, and how I want to benefit. And for me, again, Gaia X will provide us with that platform which is allowing the free flow of data and, and all the, the innovation benefits which come from that. Thank you so much. Um, so this question that we had uh, from Jens, just to come back to it, and this is from Marco, um, is, is the government willing to enter in Gaia-X first? And of course, I guess it's uh, the, uh, the consortium that are adopting the Gaia-X uh, platform or ecosystem. But is the government willing to set that example and take that first leap? So um, we are not only, we are talking um, to our colleagues and other ministries within the German government. They cannot disclose the participation of the German government and the, uh, the adoption of Gaia-X solutions right now, because obviously, as I said in the beginning, Gaia-X is uh, um, not, only, it's not focused, but it's taking the business and the user perspective into account. Obviously, there is connections to governmental usage, but this is something I, in my um, seat now, cannot disclose as something. You need to answer um, our colleagues from the Ministry of the Interior and Finance. Nevertheless, I can assure you that we are talking to them, that they are collaborating with us, and that we share the goals and the ideas behind that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Tim. Tim Stuktai, you are up. Uh, please identify yourself and ask your question to, or identify who you want to ask your question to. Somebody needs to unmute him. Okay, Hi, you're unmuted. Stuktai from the Brandenburg Institute for Society and Security, and I have a question which is a little bit um, German-centric uh, and political, so I um, addressing Marco and Danielle uh, in particular. Uh, and I hope you can hear me all right, because my internet uh, connection is a little instable, and that leads me to my Welcome question. to Germany. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, uh, does the Gaia X, uh, does the Gaia X initiative will have an impact on um, the availability of broadband, and in particular, in um, with fiber optic uh, networks, to increase the availability and the capacity? because that is what is ultimately needed if you want the free flow of data. So is that go going to be in some way associated, the Gaia-X initiative and broadband availability in Germany? Thank you. Uh, very, very good and always, always peren the perennial question. Maybe Danny, you can start and then Marco. I mean, yeah, Mark, Mark, I'll leave it to Marco to say if it's connected to Gaia X or, or, or it's not. I guess, I guess it's not. It's a, it's connected, obviously, literally connected. On the other hand, I mean, this is, I mean, this is. It, it's sort of, it's sort of embarrassing yeah, for 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 Germany. And I make the, I make the um, the uh, experience myself when I'm in the train, when I'm on the road. Uh, you lack uh, internet connection, and I'm not, I'm not talking about 5G. I'm talking about regular internet connection just to check my emails and now since as i said that we uh, are facing the corona crisis we realize what it means to be dependent upon a, a, a good internet connection. Same as uh, with homeschooling that we currently face, yeah, about digital education. I mean, you can have the best tools, you can have the best teachers. We're working on this as well, yeah. But if you don't have the, uh, the internet connection on it, this doesn't make sense at all. And as I, as I said, once again, getting back to my hometown of, of Baden-Württemberg, if you want to convince and getting back, yeah, we are we are this central country. This is different from, for example, Paris in France, where you have seventy or eighty percent of the businesses 
located around the Paris hub. We have Bavaria, we have North Rhine-Westphalia, we have Baden-Württemberg, we have Berlin. This is these central countries, so we need a connection basically everywhere. And my uh, my, my my party has uh, posed a, um, a legislative proposal on that just a couple of months ago. I mean, this is with a lot of pathos, and this is also with a lot of party politics, but the headline was, and a good internet connection should be a human right, yeah? like water or electricity, uh, to participate in a digital world, uh, whether it be an um, um, a internet connection for, uh, for, uh, for schools, for business, for self-employment, whatsoever. And so this is the backbone in, in, in a country that thinks itself as an as a industrial uh, a country. I mean, this should be the backbone, and I hope that we will move forward on that. And, and when we had the Jama Jamaican negotiations, yeah, when the conservatives, the liberals, and the Greens were negotiating uh, a, a treaty for government uh, two years ago, which unfortunately didn't happen and didn't turn out, the option on the table was that we will sell the stake in the German telecom, which is about worth 10 billion euros, and we take this money and put it in a fund uh, to, in order to mobilize further uh, private funds in order to move forward on fiber optics. But um, um, we're still uh, where we are and hopefully this will change with a, a, a new government and a new mindset on that. Marco, Alexander, I'll leave the rest to you. <laughs> Yes, sir, thank you. Um, um, but exactly as Danja said, a federal state like the Federal Republic of Germany has special needs because of its federal uh, nature, the federal system. But this is not only a special need, it's a special hindrance too. Because even uh, although, and politicians and civil servants, they tend to give this answer if, uh, if whatever possible, I am not responsible for the broadband. Nevertheless, I um, want to bring one point to your attention. Um, a federal state, has federal decision making processes. So even if we from the federal government say now we give 15 billions uh, more into broadband, then it's nevertheless the decision in the end of a local mayor whether he wants to tear open his streets to, uh, to, uh, for broadband. And in the end, if he has an election coming, maybe he decides, oh, I can wait two more years because now it's there is election coming. I don't want my main street to be torn open and all the other things. This is not an excuse. It's just to show you that the federal state has not only special need, it has special hindrances for such processes too. Gaia X itself is not connected to the broadband um, initiatives directly, as Daniel correctly uh, um, um, assumed. But nevertheless, I am of the very simple opinion that wherever there is demand, then there is more pressure, and when there is a lot of pressure, then maybe something happens. And if we are able, and this is a goal of GAIA-X, to raise demand, especially in small and medium enterprises, especially, and they are uh, located, especially in uh, the, uh, all over the Federal uh, Republic of Germany, then we, need, we raise the pressure for governments, local governments, state governments, and for ourselves to make progress on broadband. Right, Thanks and so Tyson, can I, can I add one, one uh, Please, quick thing? Go for it. Just to share an anecdote, maybe for the European and, and American uh, um, followers on this, uh, just to show you the sort of very German discussion on that. A mayor, because Marco Alexander perfectly said how, how, how it works. A, a mayor told me that um, he didn't have the money and he didn't want to uh, go into this project, but no one else was caring about it. So he uh, found, uh, uh, he went to, to neighboring communities and said, okay, let's do this together. There was in a, in a rural area. And in the moment where they opened up the ground, yeah, where they, when they were digging holes, the private companies came and said, ah, great, you are opening up the earth. Let's, let, uh, we want to join, we want to put our cables there as well. And I'm, 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 I deeply uh, believe in competition and in a market economy, but this is an infrastructure topic. Yeah? We don't need three cables parallel go the same way, we need one. And this is also where I think the strong of a government or the state or the public institution whatsoever comes into play to have also uh, uh, the the um, who's, 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 who should be dedicated to organize this uh, infrastructure, maybe in some uh, 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 part, uh, in some partnering with uh, private companies. But from my point of view, it's also the rely responsibility of a government to get uh, to get this topic done. Uh, thanks so much, Danny. We have time for one final question. We have got one uh, person waiting very patiently. 
uh, David uh, Shemenko, you get the final question. Uh, please identify yourself and address your question to somebody. Yes, thank you. I hope you're hearing me all right. I'm David Shemenko. I'm with TUF North in Berlin. I have a question, maybe mostly for Daniel, but maybe also for Marco Alexander. It's regarding, uh, you talked about industrial policy before and how Gaia X is a part of that. And now uh, I want to ask, like, um, a lot of the arguments regarding how Gaia X should be adopted, especially on like quality and like how it will be like a very good choice, especially for like edge or for security or privacy, GDPR compliance or something like that. But say it's not adopted like that, and that might be able to compete on price. I don't know if that's true. Um, so say if it doesn't get adopted, would it be an option to do like? industrial policy and say we're going to give certain in incentives for usage of Gaia X um, to like use Gaia X and not one of the non-European competitors. Yeah, that's the question. Thank you. It's a, that's a great question. So uh, maybe uh, Daniel and then Marco Alexander and then we'll wrap up. Uh, Marco, you go ahead because may, may, I, I, didn't get the, I didn't get the whole question to be the, honest. The question or, or was yeah, the question was essentially, uh, if let's say Gaia X raises prices or creates a situation where uh, Gaia X uh, participants are uncompetitive vis-a-vis -vis other uh, providers, will the government provide or should the government provide incentives uh, in some form uh, to encourage uh, users to adopt Gaia X uh, participants? Um. Thank you for repeating the question because I had the same problem as Daniel. Um, I will be very frank about this. Um, the thing, uh, the, the thought of handing out money to adopt Gaia X sounds to me like industrial policy from the 20th century. And um, I think what differs or what makes Gaia X different from such policies is that next level, 21st century industrial politics, what we're doing. We are combining the efforts of member states, of companies, to address the lack of um, technological and data sovereignty that we feel. The um, complete opposite would have been, and this is a 20th century industrial policy too, to just spend like 10 billion on a single company, maybe force even some other European companies to invest in that company too, and then say, okay, now build a hyperscaler. You look there, AWS, Google, IBM, Microsoft, whoever, just do what they do and do it for Europe. This and this, uh, I think, has been made pretty clear by Ursula and my um, um, points, the points that we rose. Um, I think this is not going to be the case, um, that we should do, do proceed like this. Nevertheless, I think that um, Gaia Excel itself has to be competitive. It needs to be competitive. And the thing is, it's, it doesn't have to be competitive with single cloud providers from wherever in the world. The thing is, it needs to be competitive as a solution to problems companies really have and to, they, they, to pressure that they really feel. And again, I don't think that's a price question. And in the end, it's quality that decides. Price is important, of course, but once you know what the, the innovative and creative potential of data sharing is, then you want an easy solution that works. All right. Uh, and Daniel, do you want to uh, add in on that? You're good? I agree. Okay. I agree. Perfect. Uh, so um, 20th century uh, is uh, creating a price incentives or, or paying people to adopt or forcing. I think that's a great note to end on. It's quality that matters. Um, I have to say for me as a kind of think tanker, somebody outside watching uh, the Gaia X uh, policy experiment has been really fascinating. And this is going to be a great um, project to accompany in the coming years. Uh, Marco Alexander, we look forward to your invitation. Uh, in the coming weeks and months uh, and to be part of this process. And thanks to you and to Ursula and Daniel for this great discussion. And uh, we will see each other soon. Thanks, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.